able to join along today and uh, on this wonderful Shabbat day. And we're in Houston, Texas with Brother John Kostick. And there's been many of you guys asked about Edom. And how do you know that Edom represents Rome today in the Bible? And so Brother John has done a lot of research on this. It's something that's a passion of his is to uh, talk about Israel. Uh, and to talk, uh, he studies the Hebrew language a lot and very interesting. John is also on our website. Of course, right now you don't see it because of the, uh, the issues that we've had that when the, the website was hacked. But in the past and, of course, in the future when we get it back up, the content, John is the one that you see that, that uh, writes the, uh, the, the different interesting things about the Hebrew language and what they represent. And uh, so... What do you call those anyway, John? When you, I don't know what to name yeah. it. I don't know. I call them charts. There we go. Amen. Yeah. So they're just fascinating, and it and it looks at the different things in the Bible, um, and looking at the Hebrew letters, what they represent, taking the ancient, uh, the, the 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 Hebrew alphabet, and the different symbols and how they represent. Like the yod represents the hand. Uh, the hay represents. Uh, what would you call the hay again? The hay is the hay is the one that the, the Jews have trouble uh, defining. Hay five. It's God's his his essence, his breath. Uh, I mean, you right. listen to a Jew try to describe hay, and it just it, it, what it is. It's his grace. Amen. And that's they just can't grasp the entirety of his grace. Amen. But that's what hay is. It's the it's, something's revealed. Something's being poured out. Right. It's ac absolutely incredible. And uh, and let me... Ooh, glasses. Yes. I can't work without glasses anyway. So, hey, it's like, it looks like a, a, the figure of a man in, in, the, in the ancient uh, the Hebrew uh, alphabet there. And, and I'll, we'll, we actually, when we produce this video on there, I'll actually put... Uh, so you'll be able to see this. You know, you're hearing us talk about it now. Of course, we don't see it. But when we do the... Uh, the graphics, we'll put some of that in there so you can see just exactly what some of these letters represent, like the yod, like the hay. Uh, I'll share that with you guys. Anyhow, let's let's go right into the Word of God. And uh, if you have your Bible, we'll turn to Ezekiel. And uh, Before you start, okay. the two that he mentioned, the yod and the hay, the yod hay is Yah. That's, that's God's name. Amen. And the two pictures, the yud is hand, and the hay is something's revealed. The hand reveals. The hand reveals who Yah is. Amen. Exactly. You know, and if you want to go his full name, yud hey vav hey, are we allowed to spell that? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, spelling it is okay. If you write his name, then we'd have to take a chainsaw and cut your wall out and go bury it. <laughs> exactly. But the yud vav is a nail. So if you take his full name, yud hey vav hey. It's the hand reveals, the nail reveals. Who's that? Amen. Amen. It ought to be obvious. Yeah, it's obvious. Amen. Anyway, John wrote, and we're going to publish this on the website uh, as soon as I can get this over to Aaron, but John wrote a letter to a, to a couple of friends of his. One was a Jewish man uh, in New York. Uh, the other was a Catholic man. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where's the other? Where does he live? Well, it doesn't matter as far as... It doesn't as, matter. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> the two people he wrote the letter to is very interesting uh, on Edom, and... Uh, John said he took it from the teachings that I've done on Adam, but then he expounded on that with the insights that God has given him, and I was really blown away by it. And so I asked him, let's do a video about Adam, and then that way John can kind of fill in the blanks. I talk to you from the way God reveals it to my heart, and uh, John can fill in the blanks the way God has dealt with him on it to show you Adam from a scriptural standpoint. So just kind of setting the stage for it, we'll take and we'll take and go back and look at some of the scriptures I've talked to you about before. Uh, beginning in Ezekiel chapter 25, verse 12 to 14. This is the judgment uh, on Adam. And it says, Thus saith the Lord God, because that Adam hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and hath greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand upon Adam and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Timon, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom 
by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to mine anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. Now, keep in mind here, you have some key little verses which help identify who Edom, who Edom actually is in this point here, because he says in, in verse 12 here, Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and hath greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Obviously, we're not talking about, uh, uh, about the time frame of the house of Israel being there, 723 years before when the Syrians came in and fought Israel for 10 years and took the house of Israel captive and scattered them throughout the world. So there is one particular time where there is a massive vengeance, and we'll find in other, in other places as well, regarding Adam, uh, that deals specifically with the house of Judah. And of course, in 70 AD, Rome comes in, and Rome takes and, and kills, uh, slaughters the Jews that are in Israel, and then takes them captive throughout the, and, and scatters them throughout the world. So, um, John, if you would have liked you, you'd have just kind of start bringing in some of the, the things that, that God has shown you, the points that you see about Adam as well. Well, I guess you've got to start at the beginning, which the, the, the obvious is the word Adam in Hebrew means... Red. Red. That's, uh, that's where it starts. And we, the first instance maybe of it is, is when um, Isaac and Rebecca have the twins. Rebecca has the twins in her... And they're fighting, and they're the two nations. But whenever Esau is born first, he comes out with red hair. And they call him... Edom. Edom. Or, or Esau. Is it Edom or Edom? Ed, Edom is actually... I mean, some people... It, it just depends. Uh, some okay. people can say Edom, some say Edom. Um, yeah. So I guess it depends on who's pronouncing it. Okay. Put the emphasis on whatever syllable you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. So Edom or Edom... Um, so. Uh, we see Esau is called Edom, right? And we see it again whenever he goes to uh, Jacob and asks for stew, or demands stew. You know, feed my face with that Adam Adam, that red red stuff. You know, he's not asking very nicely. But at least we see that red Edom we, ties the two together. Exactly. And when Esau and Jacob parted, Esau goes to an area which is called the land of Edom or the land of Esau. And so that's the area south of the Dead Sea, right. over into Jordan. Yeah, it, it encompasses uh, southern Jordan and southern Israel as far as if we're looking at a map today, which you wouldn't be able to see here because like John has a magnifying glass, but uh, that's for all the skeptics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Israel is there. And, uh, and, and point in, in, in case here, let me just kind of point this out. Israel is right here, a little tiny sliver of land. And I, I've said many times before, if you take the, the Arabic lands, uh, you have Egypt here, you have Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, all this whole area here. Yemen, Oman, all of this here. And look at that. I mean, this is uh, Turkey even for, for, for that matter. You know, we're, we're talking about, yeah, <laughs> go, John, John's got, I could use this with, well, we won't go into that, but anyway, when you take these, these different countries, or even Libya, all these here, the, the Arabic countries that you have, if you look at that huge area, Pakistan, Afghanistan even, you've got the area the size of the United States. And yet Israel gets a little tiny place about the size of what? New Jersey, Rhode Island maybe, uh, something like that. And yet they want to divide this land as well and give half to the Palestinians, which actually the Palestinians, there's really no such thing as Palestinians. They're part of, the, the people who are called Palestinians are part of these lands that are surrounding Israel. Uh, mainly they came in during the time when Israel became a nation in order to help build the nation. Uh, but nonetheless, that's another story altogether. But down in southern part, the southern part of Israel, encompassing into Jordan as well, was a land known as Edom. Uh, so continue yeah. on. Well, I've driven from uh, across Edom. You drive from the Dead Sea down to the to the Red Sea. It's just complete desolate. You're crossing the desert, and then if you drive up to Petra, you're driving through that. And it truly is the end of the earth. I mean, there's nothing growing there. It's the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is, there's no fish, there's no plants, there's nothing growing there that may, I mean, the, the Jews have come in and they've put in 
you know, agricultural right. and, and farms and, and, and watery, but, but naturally nothing grows there. Right, and even in Jordan. Now, the point is though, and then we look at Adam and we begin to see that uh, there's, there's key scriptures that tell us who Adam is spiritually speaking. God is showing us because if you go down there, like John said, it's, it's just a desolate area. He's showing you what he's going to do to, in this case here, Rome representing Edom. He's going to show you what he's going to do to them. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah was in Edom. Exactly. And I mean, there's nothing, there's no signs at all of, of those two. Exactly. Uh, so it, he does make it a desolation. Abs absolutely. So, so far we have Edom is red, Edom is Esau, Edom is the land that Esau went to, and Edom is also... Uh, the, well, Adam is also the descendants of Esau, that yes. are sometimes referred to, um, and another. And it's also representative of a desolate place. It's the Timbuktu of the Jews. It's the Patagonia of the Hispanics. It's the end of the earth. That's that's the code word the Jews use for their end of the earth. Exactly. Okay. Now, before you go into the punchline for Adam, let me take uh, the people to Malachi. Uh, <clears throat> In Malachi chapter 1, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Malachi the prophet, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Okay, now remember, Esau did settle in that area down there. And like what John is explaining, it is nothing but desolate now. But at one time, it was not desolate. That's what's really fascinating. It wasn't desolate. It says, whereas Adam saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Now, that's interesting. Now we realize it must be a spiritual application because it's not been rebuilt. I mean, And he's not talking mm -hmm. about Israel just because they have built the little seacoast right there. You know, this spiritual land Adam is, is being rebuilt. Now, mm. spiritual Adam is being rebuilt. We will, we will be, we will rebuild. Now, uh, the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build. Now, God even says they're going to build, but He says, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of the of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Um, Let's see, let me make sure I didn't miss a spot here. Didn't, okay. And your eyes shall see and you shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Now, let me back up again. Let me go to verse 4 here. Wherefore, Adam saith, we, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of the wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. So Adam promises to rebuild. But the question is, is where do they rebuild? And if you can go into that a little bit, John, as far as bringing up more about the, the story of Adam yeah. and how does it how does it end up applying to Rome? Well, there is one more step before we get to Rome, and that is, uh, and, and by the way, where he says here that he uh, Jacob he is loved and uh, Yaakov he is loved and uh, Esau he is hated, he's not talking about the two boys. Just exactly. he's talking. Yeah, if you it's, go back to metaphor speaking. Yeah, go back to Genesis prophetic. twenty-five. Rebecca had two nations in her womb, yes. and it's the two nations that he loves: Yaakov, Jacob, Israel. He hates Edom, Esau. And if you look today, Edom, Esau hates Israel. They're picking on him. Exactly, that, and that's a good point to bring out as well, John, because uh, that's something I've noticed as well. Is that it, it does come to a fact that it's the peoples. It's what it's what Esau would come to represent. Yeah, it's, he's, he. God loves the Palestinian people. God loves the Jewish people. God loves exactly everyone. Exactly, and, and it's, even and, and, it's the nations that's got a problem with. Yes, and even when you look at uh, Edom, and so should you. That's right. Even yeah. though Edom is is in representation of of Rome. It's not even the Catholic people that he is against. It's the system that hates Israel. And when, when, the, when you hate someone that God has chosen to carry out the, the plan of salvation for him, I mean, this is why he calls it the apple of his eye. 
you know, because here God has taken and he's raised up Israel for the sole purpose to bring salvation into the world, and they carry out the, the, the very, everything about salvation that God intended for them to do. You know, they had, he had to blind their eyes so that they would crucify the Messiah or hand him over to the Romans to have him crucified. And, and the, they did what God called them to do. And so therefore, he knows what they play. He knows what he's punished them for, and yet he blinded them. So therefore, his mercy is so much out there for Israel. And, and yet, when the people begin to turn against them, that's what really seems to, that bothers God tremendously. Yeah. Um, let's take, before we go into showing how Rome becomes Edom, or Edom. Yeah, we've got to tie in Yom Kippur. Okay, go ahead. Let's you go with that then. Yeah, because that that is probably the next step in this. Yom Kippur is that one of the seven Moedim. Moed is the appointed times. Uh, as Gentiles, we refer to them as the appointed times of the Lord, or the feasts of the Lord. In Hebrew, it's Moed. Yes, is singular Moedim, plural. There's seven of them: Passover, uh, unleavened bread, uh, yeah. first fruits. Yes. Shavuot is Pentecost. Right. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, which remember the kids got off school and you, the Jewish kids got off school and we didn't. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were Jewish. You got to get off. That's right. Uh, so. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, and Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, is the seventh. These are most important if you want to know the timeline of what's coming. Exactly. But Yom Kippur was the Day of Atonement. This was once a year where the high priest of Israel would bring two goats to the temple. Um, one of the t go they would cast lots. One of them would be the sacrificial goat, where he would take that, kill the goat, take its blood, go into the uh, tabernacle or the temple, yes. uh, go behind the veil, pour the ark, uh, pour the blood on the ark of the covenant, and this would forgive the sins of Israel, the entire yes. nation, for the entire year. The other goat was called the Azazel, which is the scapegoat. Uh, speaking of Azazel, it comes from kind of the same word, Gaza, comes from the same root word. Yes. Gaza, Azazel, get goat, stubborn, head butting. It's not a coincidence. So the Azazel. Especially at the time we're dealing with yes. right now. So the Azazel, the scapegoat, the high priest would, would lay his hands on it and push down and, and literally transfer all the sins of Israel onto the scapegoat. Then they would take the scapegoat out of town and they would take it to Mount Seir. Mount Seir is in Edom. In Edom. They wanted these sins taken far, far away. Get them out of here. And they so they take that goat someplace and most Jews that I've talked to have said that they would take him to Mount Seir and throw the goat off of a cliff. They definitely didn't want that goat coming back into town a week, a month later, bringing all the sins back into town. Exactly. And I mean, think about it. Ever since we talked about that right there, John, I have wondered, there has to be something laying in there because we know that Yeshua is going to return. And if there was a fear of the Jewish people that that goat would return and bring the sins back. And, and I have yet to figure out what it is yet, but it's just like the Lord is dealing with my heart on there. There's, a, there's something there about that because if the goat comes back, they didn't want their sins returning. So uh, it, it has to have some kind of application to it. Well, to Yeshua, sure. when Yeshua came, he was, he was cleverly pointing out the sins of the Pharisees and of Israel. That's right. I mean, he was, uh, he, he's not big into pointing in often, but he, he let them know, you know. And so they were happy to, let's get him crucified and out of here. They didn't want him coming back, like you say, with bringing up those sins again. Exactly. So the thing is, though, is there's got to be, there, I think that there's a deeper meaning even in, in there with that, because he does come back, and he is coming back. So... I've yet to see. I've got to really go pray about that, but I feel like that there's something that God has hidden underneath that. Yeah. Let's take a look at. Let's take a look at another Bible verse here before you give away the punchline on Edom and the significance from uh, 
Lamb of Wilderness. What's he trying to say, guys? I don't even know. There's a punchline. What's the punchline I'm supposed to be? Uh, keep referring to. I'm gonna, I'll get to that in a minute. I'll remind <laughs> you the punchline. I love the punchline here. Anyway, all right. We're going to take a look at Jeremiah chapter 49. Um, and then, you know, we, we should, uh, if we just take a minute just to talk about Joseph and that scapegoat concept. Yeah, we can do that. Because it, there's such a beautiful tie-in that it... Yeah, because when, when you look at Joseph, the, the beautiful part about Joseph, and, 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 and granted, there's a lot of people, we have new people every day that have no idea about the story of Joseph. I personally believe that this is where God, when he gave Moses the law about the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat, I think it comes from the story of Joseph. Because yeah. you got to remember, Joseph was here before Moses was here. And so, in, in the story of Joseph, his brothers, when they take and they rejected him, like it was Yeshua, he was rejected, and then he was taken and... Uh, they see him come and they said, Behold, this dreamer comes. Let's see, you know, let's let's do away with him and then let's see what is what happens to his dreams and visions. Then boy, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with this problem. It's kind of like Yeshua, if you think about it. They they said when he was on the cross, if thou be the Son of God, you know, come down on the cross, save yourself, then we'll believe you. In other words, let's see what's really gonna happen with your with your dreams and visions. And so uh, he comes. They take hold of him, and now the beautiful thing is, and I know John probably likes this part here because he's really into the the what the symbology is in in the uh, in, in the letters and symbolism, stuff. symbolism, <laughs> symbology. I'm, I'm creating a new word. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the names of the brothers, every name of the brothers and what they did. Oh yeah, like Reuben. You know, he is, Reuben is the only one that actually has compassion on Joseph and doesn't want anything evil to happen to him. And so they're they're having to argue with him as they throw him into this ditch here, the or and, this well, so to speak. Yeah. And the word Reuben means behold the sun. That's right, behold the sun. So they're sitting there every time because in Hebrew you have to understand every name is a Hebrew word. It's a sentence necessarily. Like Yitzhak means he laughs. So every time, even if we were to use it in a sentence today and we're going to talk about he laughs, we're going to say Yitzhak. So when you said a name, it carries it, it carries more than what, we, what you would think of in English and everything. So when they would say Reuben, they're sitting there saying, behold the sun, behold the sun. And, and so you would think, hello, something, uh, something's going on here. The same thing even like when they come down and their brother, they recognize, you know, they don't recognize their brother, but the thing is, is Joseph takes and he binds Simon up and puts him in the prison, and that means hears. So mm -hmm. he binds their hearing up. Uh, but anyway, the, 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 yeah, really the, main point, yeah. Yeah, the main point that we want to get to right in here is that when, when his brothers, they put him in the pit, he's supposed to be dead so to speak. It's kind of like the analogy there. They, they sell him out. Uh, there's a caravan of Ishmaelites that come along. Uh, they sell him out. Of course, he goes down into Egypt. Uh, but in doing so, they take a goat, a kid of the goats. They take his coat of long sleeves. And I know there's people say the coat of many colors. I'm really trying to figure still where that comes from. There's got to be a reason why people say that. But in Hebrew, it literally says a coat of long sleeves is what it says. They pour the blood of that goat on the coat, take it back to their father, and say, discern whether or not this be your son's coat or not. Now, God undoubtedly accepts that goat as a sacrificial lamb for them. And in this case here, uh, their brother, Joseph, uh, he is, as he's taken down to Egypt, he is that scapegoat. He's the Azazel. And, and they yeah. literally put their hands on him in order to do what they're doing like the high priest does. So their, their sins are going on their brother forcibly putting him away and, that, and he's taken away. It's the same thing with Yeshua. There's your analogy again. Yeshua, they lay their hands upon him and they bring him to judgment. And their sins were forcibly being put on Yeshua and at the same token, he bears, like Joseph, he bears the sins of Israel very far away. And yet, in, in, in Yeshua's case, in Jesus' case, he becomes the sacrificial goat as well. So his blood comes out, and of course, they say, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And had God not applied that blood, 
Israel would not be today. And there's that same parallel. Israel is saying, let his, the Jews are saying, let his blood be upon us and our children. They didn't mean we want to be saved by this exactly. man's blood. Exactly. They're, they're, they're being almost mocking, you yes. know. But God took their mocking attitude and said, okay, the blood of Yeshua will cover you as well. And you go back to Joseph, it's the same picture. They, they killed this goat and put, the, put it on the coat for nefarious, bad, evil reasons. Yes. And God looked down, all he saw was the blood. And when he sees the blood, he forgives. Yes. Regardless if their intentions was, the blood wasn't meant to, to get no, forgiveness. No, it wasn't. It's the same thing with, with Israel. They, they meant it for a derogatory purpose. They meant it for evil. And they're just trying to hide their sins. They're trying yeah. to cover their sins. And yet... They were fortunate enough to try hiding it with blood. Exactly. And that was the, that's the magic. That's right. And, and had they not... God would have God would have been obligated to destroy them, yeah, because of what they done. And it's the same thing with Israel. Had that blood, had they not cried out, "Let His blood be upon us," even though they meant it evil, God would have had to have wiped out, at least in their case. Now the, yeah. the house of Israel was already uh, gone at that point there, but the the, ben, uh, the the house of Judah, you'd have Benjamin, Judah, and the tribe of Levi. And the Samaritans, uh, whatever Samaritans would have been involved, but mainly would have been the three tribes there, they'd have been wiped out. Yeah. And we wouldn't have no 12 tribes. Do we have 60 seconds that I can just sure. throw out something? The, check your Bible. Because a lot of versions, that's that verse in the, where he's being sold into Egypt. Right. It says that some Midianite traders, what, this is 37, Genesis 37, 28. Let's look at it. Yeah, because this... 37.28, yes. Genesis 37.28 says, Then Midianite traders passed by. So, now here's... This is King... This is... Uh, what is this one? New King James. Then Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled up Joseph and lifted him out of the pit. What and verse are you in there? Just so 28. 28, okay. 37, 28. Uh, then Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. So you've got Midianites here. You've got Ishmaelites here. Are you reading in the Hebrew there? Uh, what it says here, for... Um... For he is our brother and our flesh, and his brothers hearken to him. Then there passed by Midianim, merchants, uh, and they drew and lifted up Yosef out of the pit and sold Yosef to the Yishmaelim. Okay. Does it say the word brothers in there at all? Let me look at it in Hebrew real quick. Hang on one second. Because what he just read did not say the brother. It said Midianim, which is plural for Midianites. The Midianites passed by. And they pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him to Ishmaelites. It's, it's, King James added the words, the brothers pulled him out of the pit. In the Hebrew, it does not say the brothers pulled him out of the pit. And that's a very important detail, I think, because... In the next verse, you have Reuben coming to the pit, looking down, and he's surprised that Joseph's not there. And he goes back and tells his brothers, hey, he's not there. Well, if the brothers had sold, pulled him out of the pit and sold him, they would have known he's not there. But they didn't know that. In Hebrew, what it says here is that uh, um, the Midianim, Sacharachim, Um Excuse me. Be Mishahu ve Alanu et a Yosef Minha Kira. So it actually implies more that it's the Midianim that are the merchants. It doesn't really say which one pulls him out of the pit directly. Uh, but when you read. But it, who are these Midianites? Why? If, if, if he ends up sold to the Ishmaelites. Right. Why do you have Midianite traders passing by? Because it says the Midianite traders passed by and they pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites. 
And so you end up, the, Jew, the, the brothers didn't actually do the selling. They plotted, they planned, they wanted him out, but they didn't actually drive the nail. Oh, excuse me, did I say that out loud? They didn't actually do the crime. Right. And that's a parallel to future times yes. because the Jews have been blamed for 2,000 years for, for what the Romans did. For what the Romans did. But the, yeah. but the Jews, the brothers, Jesus' brothers didn't actually kill him. Joseph's brothers didn't actually sell him. It's, exactly. There's, exactly. Yeah. yeah that's and it's, exactly, it's, that's, exactly. that's a parallel that's very important. That's exactly right. Uh, and I'd have to agree with that, too. Um, Verse 29, Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more. Where shall I go? So Reuben is surprised when he doesn't see him in the pit. So I don't think the brothers pulled him out and yeah. sold him. That's, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit the type. It doesn't fit the text. Yeah. But that's, exactly. an, that's an important, but that gets us off yeah. subject. <laughs> it, is, it is good. And I know we talked about that once before. And I, and I never got back to really take a look at that. But, but you're right. It's, it's assumed that his brothers pull him out of the pit. But in reality... It doesn't actually say that. It doesn't, and it, and it kind of it, all, all that Israel does. Israel hands Yeshua over to the Roman authority, and then the Roman authority takes care of the rest. I mean, now granted, it was Judas that sells him. Uh, you know, in that case, and it was Judah who said, "What does it profit us to to kill him? Let's let's sell him." Exactly. There's the parallel, but they didn't do it. But they've been blamed for it. But they're guilty of it. They're guilty. Yep. Because of, they had to do it. I mean, yes. the thing is, 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 that was the whole part about Israel being the sacrificial or, or the, the priestly nation. The priestly nation has to bring the lamb up. The, yeah. They have to be the ones that hand over the lamb for that purpose. Uh, so, so nonetheless, we know, and, and I've always thought that as well, it was the Romans that actually do the killing of him. And this is another reason why God intends to punish Adam. Yeah. Because, well, yeah, we need to get back to Adam. <laughs> yes. They're the ones that actually killed him. Yeah. And yet, and the funny thing is, is they blame it all on the Jews. In fact, that's that's the funny thing of all. If you go back to the Holocaust, you go to the pogroms, you go to the Inquisition, especially the Inqu Inquisition, you know, the Spanish Inquisition is one of the biggest ones where the Vatican was putting to death the Jews. Either you converted or they killed you, and they kept calling the Jews the Christ killers. You know, and, and the yet, ir the irony, hypocrisy yes. is is deafening, because it's because they were the ones that did it. Yeah, and that's what we we do that with uh, even with the Jacob and Esau story. Ah, that the dirty Jew wouldn't even feed his brother Esau when he came begging for food, or all oh, the dirty Jews they'd sell their own brother into slavery. No, they're getting it wrong. It's just it's the guilty is blaming the innocent Jew for something that he didn't do. Yeah, you know? but. We know that we, 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 we had to play one part in there, nonetheless. But see, God is going to bring that punishment out because God knows who... He did. knows He knows the he guilty. He knows who yeah. drove those nails into his hand. He yeah. knows who drove them into his feet. And so... That's, yeah. that's and the Jews have been punished for the last 2,000 years for the role they played. Yes. Now it's exactly. time for the Romans to get their punishment for the role they played. Exactly. And that's coming up. Now... Yeah. Here's the punchline that John keeps saying. What's the punchline? I gotta have him tell the punchline. Okay, well we're gonna get to. Oh, go ahead. This is where John will, as he did in the letter, and, and my wife is reading as I drive. Uh, the letter is is very passionate, and and I thank God for what He has given him. But why? How did Rome get the name Edom or Adam? Well. Around uh, the time of Yeshua, in Rome was in charge of the uh, of the Holy Land, and Rome, if you know the Daniel prophecies, Rome is the the legs of iron. I mean, they are they are going to be a fierce empire, and they were a fierce empire, and they didn't take uh, kindly to uprisings. They put them down, and the Jews did not like being under the thumb of Rome, so they. Uh, and they couldn't go down the street and say, man, I really hate Rome. Because you'd get stabbed through with a spear. That's right. So they came up with a code name for Rome. Now, right now, you just think, well, how do you know this? Well, it's uh, the code name that they came up with was the most evil, horrible, desolate, rotten place you could think of, Edom. It makes sense. Yeah, I mean, they don't like Rome. They're going to call it Edom. 
Yes. It, the earliest examples, this shows up in, in writings uh, from the Bar Kokhba uh, revolt around 132 AD. They have there, people are writing that Edom is Rome. So if it's, if it's commonplace enough to be written, it must be very commonplace to be, have been spoken. Exactly. So we have early, early reference, uh, written reference that Edom is Rome. We know that uh, Rome was in charge and they needed a code name. And uh, now I've asked, I have some, some ultra-Orthodox Jewish friends and some just secular Jewish friends. Um, but if I ask them, what does Edom mean? The first thing they say is red. Then they say Esau. Then they say the land. <laughs> so we repeated. It's the land below it. Right. It's uh, where they sent the scapegoat. The sa scapegoat was sent to Mount Seir, which was in Edom. Um, so they also refer to Edom as the last place on earth. You're Timbuktu. Um, but then they always say it's Rome. So there today they acknowledge Edom is Rome. Well now when you... When you put that into the theology and into the prophecies, it's like Daniel's vision is being unsealed because things are That's happening. Right. That's exactly right. Now, from the Orthodox Jew standpoint, in the Chabad organization, it is in our own writings uh, that Edom is Rome. Uh, so that's another point. In fact, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, Mark Belts, when we were talking on the phone one time, he even brought that out. He's because I asked him, I said, "Do you really realize who Edom? Do you know who Edom represents?" And he says, uh, "Oh, Steve, absolutely." He says, "Any Orthodox Jew?" He said, "You should know yourself." He said, "It's written in your writings." He said that it is it is Rome. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it is commonplace and common knowledge, and that's why. Now, here's the interesting thing. Is this the punchline? That was the punchline. No, it's not. It's still coming. Oh, it's still coming. Okay, <laughs> let's go with the rest of the punchline. <laughs> because the punchline is, where did they send in the in the oh, Yom Kippur? Yes, yes, you're right. That's right. That's the punchline. That's the punchline. <laughs> I thought the other punchline was this. Anyway, so it gets better. All right, wait a minute. Before you bring that one up, before you bring up the punchline, let me tell you one. I got to tell you one other important thing here. While he's talking, I'm going for chocolate chip cookies. How dare him? If he doesn't bring me one, then God will remember him greatly. <laughs> so, all right, so here's the thing. Let me, let me just share this with you. Yeshua himself, when he, was, when he was here on the earth, they expected that he was coming as Mashiach, as the Messiah, to deliver Israel uh, from the hand of the Romans. And that's what they were looking for, is that he was going to deliver them. And when he dies and he doesn't deliver them, then their hopes are all dashed. To them, he was the deliverer from Edom, from Edom. And it didn't happen, at least in their mind it didn't. But the thing is, is in reality, it will happen. And that's the funny thing. It's not happened as of yet. This is why we see the stage being reset. This is why we see the Roman influence in Israel right now. Remember the scripture we just read. He says, I will rebuild the desolate places. Yeah. What is the desolate places? The Edom. Bible says, that's right, not only just Edom in Israel down in southern Israel there, but God, Yeshua said, your house is left to you desolate. Now, he's talking about the human heart, in essence, is the deeper meaning of that, but he's also talking about the temple, because Jesus also prophesied there will not be one stone left upon another. Now, he's not talking about the temple mount, he was talking about the temple itself. And I'm sure John's been on the same tour, if you go underground, you can see where the stones were thrown off of there from the temple, and they're still laying on the ground to this day, underneath, the, you know, where you can see the, the remnants of that. So this is also the desolate places. I say the human heart because it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was being poured out, but because Israel would not receive it as a, as a people, uh, just a remnant received it, then their heart was left desolate for the next 2,000 years while Israel went into exile, and their eyes will come open now, and now their hearts will be refilled with the Spirit of God. And that's one reason why I think the third temple will be built. It's not going to be built for, for the for a purpose that we would love to see it rebuilt for, but mm -hmm. it'll also type to show that Israel's received received Yeshua as their Messiah. 
Now we get, as John says, into the punchline. And then what we're going to do is we're going to close with a scripture that I've not seen before in Lamentations. Uh, so let's go to the punchline. I want John to tell you this here, because this is what he saw, and it blessed my heart tremendously. It's got a switch keeping me in line here. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the Yom Kippur, the scapegoat, they put all those sins on it and sent it out to Edom. Yes. Jesus... Yeshua, he's the sacrificial goat. He, he died and his blood was applied for our sins. But he's also the scapegoat. He's the Azazel. Yes. And he takes our sins far, far away. Where was Jesus sent? Where did the Jews who found him guilty, where did they send him? To Edom. They sent him to Edom. To Rome. Yeah, and Rome did the dirty work. Yes. So, and what they thought was the dirty work, they were actually helping him get to that place far, far away. Yeah. And that was in the presence of Almighty God. And so, it's just, it just, it fits so tight. Yes. And it's just, it just works. It's incredible. Yeah. All right, Lamentations. I got to find this one here. I got to remember how does, let me, let's see here. Is Lamentations also Ecclesia? Ecclesia? No. no, I didn't think so. Uh, I think of these things in English and it mess, messes me up here. So let me... You get used to a Hebrew Bible and then you try to switch to the English Bible. Here we go, here we go. 680 and this in King James. My wife bought a 1611 King James. She saw it in the bookstore the other day and we began to read it. And I thought it was kind of funny because, you know, being used to just the old English anyway, it was easy for me to read and everything. But she began to read it. And, of course, English is her seventh language. <laughs> She's like, what? they don't know how to spell. <laughs> so, but she's kind of used to it now, so she was able to make it out as well. All right, Lamentations chapter 4. And I ran across this right here at John's house, and it, and it caught my attention. I haven't had a chance to really look into this, but let's go to verse 21. I'm going to back up a little bit because I don't know exactly what all is there. Uh, let's go to verse 16. The anger of the Lord hath divided them. He will no more regard them. They respected not the persons of the priest, that they favored not the elders. As for us, our eyes as, as yet failed for our vain help and our watching. We have watched for our nation that could not save us. They hurt, uh, excuse me, they haunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled for our end is come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits, of whom we have said, said under his shadow, we shall live among the heathen. Wow, that's some interesting stuff. I'll have to definitely come back on this here. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Adam, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee, and thou shalt be drunken, and shalt make thyself naked. Now, you think about Revelation. The great harlot that was drunken yeah. with the blood of the saints. Yeah, and you got to tie that in, because we're saying that Edom is Rome. Yes. you got to realize the, the, the part that Rome is about to play yes. in this whole end times, because... We have the Daniel 9, 26, the prince of the people who shall come. This. And, and, and notice, though, it's the daughter of Edom. Yeah. So it's just like with the daughter of Zion. If you look at Malachi, excuse me, Micah chapter 4, and going around verse 9, 10, and 11, the daughter of Zion, it represents a future generation when you mm -hmm. talk about the daughter. And the daughter of Zion gets deliverance. Uh, from all of this. Now we're looking at the daughter of Edom. So this is not when uh, Edom is, or Edom is dealing with Israel 2,000 years ago. This is that future generation yeah. of what we're dealing with now. So he says here, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken, and shall make thyself naked. Then the Bible clearly says about 
in, in another place in Revelation when he's talking about, the, uh, I think it's the Laodiceans. He said, you're blind, miserable, naked, and don't even know it. Mm -hmm. So then he says, the punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished. O daughter of Zion, he will no more carry thee away into captivity. Now he's dealing with Zion. See, now he's talking about Israel. Their punishment is finished. Yeah. Which is when they recognize Yeshua to be Messiah. He will, uh, excuse me, he will, uh, excuse what, no more carry thee away into the captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sin. So at the very time that Israel has her awakening, Edom is being judged. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're seeing. That's yeah. what we're about to see. So I've got to really go in there and study this even di deeper now than it does. I just happened to run across this when I was doing the search, trying to pull up the scriptures again before we were doing this video, and I ran across that. But you, we need to just make sure you all know, when it, we're talking about Rome, yes. it's, it's the Vatican. Yes. Right, that's the Rome. It's the spiritual side. It's the spiritual Edom. You had Esau was the physical Edom who actually went down to that southern part of Israel. That's physical Edom. Rome, Vatican is the spiritual Edom. That's exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. important to work into this. Exactly. So definitely, yeah, we don't want to forget about that. There is that we are looking at the spiritual application, and that's who. Edom is today. It is Rome. It is the Vatican. Not not Rome, just the city. Rome itself. It is where the, it's the Pope himself leading his people. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is, or I should say, unfortunately, this is one of the reasons why he says in his word, "Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and her plagues." So that's another important point: is the plagues. The thing is, is Edom or Rome in this case, the, the Catholic Church is leading the people into a tribulation where, like it was with Pharaoh in Egypt, which he is the Pharaoh, the, the Pope of Rome is the Pharaoh of today. He, he, I mean, everything that they do in symbology is just like it was in Egypt. They believe in the sun god. That's how we get the Gregorian calendar, and we have sun day. Yeah. You, you know, know, the people who are watching this, if you're not interested, you've already shut us off. If you are watching us still, <laughs> you're wishing, I hope this goes on for another hour. So if we go on for 10 more minutes, yes, that'd be they're fun. happy. That'd be okay, Because be I know I, when I watch you and watch certain ones, you just give me more, give me more. But we should maybe bring in a couple of these of what Rome is going to be doing. I mean, the Daniel 9, uh, 26. Yes. Th this is the one... Um, yeah, let's quit. That would be a good idea, John. Let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's let you know. Because we, we set the stage for who Rome is. Yeah, let's let you know what Rome's is. about to do. Yes. Because um, 926, uh, let's see. This even goes back to the part about Rebecca, the children that are in the womb, and they're warring against one another. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's literally not dealing regarding Esau. Now, he does show the nature of what they would be like, the, the hatred towards his brother. Uh, but, but even the mending of that relationship shows that it would be for a latter time. Yeah. It would not take place in that time. That's why you never see that Esau kills Jacob, although he wants to. But it's going to be fulfilled in his descendants. Yeah. And, uh, or spiritually well, in this yeah. case. Because but, but he won't succeed. The, the but Palestinians, who are what we call Palestinians today, they do want to kill the Jews. And there again, that's why when they do DNA tests, yes, they have Jewish... DNA, are they related to the Jewish people? Why? Because they're from the descendants of Esau. Esau went and instead of marrying among their own people, he went and takes, takes uh, a couple of wives from, from the Arabic peoples of that day, and the Palestinians are descended there. So yes, Abraham is their father. Yeah. And this is why we see in, in the 67 war, so many times the miracles that would happen, they would see uh, an angel of the Lord protecting the Jews, and they would cry out, Father Abraham, Abraham. You know, because yeah, it's the same father. They're, they're related. Yeah, um, in, in that re in that regard. Uh, but they're they're Esau's descendants, so they still have that desire to want to kill him. All right, Daniel chapter nine. Go ahead. Yeah, nine twenty six talks about uh, is this, this is the after sixty two weeks. We're not going to get into that, but they're talking about sixty two weeks of years, which is a, a whole bunch of years, four hundred thirty four years. Uh, it says Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. 
this you're talking about Yeshua. After a certain amount of time, yes. Yeshua is going to show up and be cut off. Then it says, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This prophecy yes. here is, is actually prophesying that the city and the sanctuary is going to be destroyed. The city and the sanctuary meaning Jerusalem and the temple. Exactly. It's prophesying that the temple is going to be destroyed. H who's going to destroy it? The people of the prince who is to come. Well, in hindsight, we can look back and see, okay, well, who, were, who was the people who is to come? Uh, who is the people who destroyed it? It was the Romans. Exactly. And if the Romans are the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary then the prince who is to come, which is one of the 33 names of Antichrist in the Old Testament, he's got 13 in the New Testament, 46 total. Now see, that was something that you mentioned to me last night, and why I've never even picked that up myself, I don't know, but go ahead with that. That's... Yeah, but so his, the, the prince who is to come, Antichrist, is of the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary. He is of the Roman people, because we know the Romans are the ones who destroyed the city and the sanctuary. Right. So we know Antichrist is coming from the revived Roman Empire. They're coming from, he's coming from Edom. He's coming from the Vatican. He's coming out of the Roman Catholic Church somehow, or the, the revived Roman Empire. It just is. You can deny it. You can complain or point fingers, but it says it. Yes. Even, even the Pope himself, the name that he takes upon, you know, uh, Pont Pontifus Maximus, comes from the, from the time when Rome was, was a power as, a, as what we might call secular power. It's, it's the same name. They never changed it. Yeah. Uh, he still believes that he has the, uh, like the Pharaoh of Egypt, uh, he believes that he is God on earth. And Moses even says this in, 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 in Exodus 15. I will, I will sing unto the Lord a future tense, and I will give victory over the horse and his rider. Not the 600, not, not the 600 that came and chased him into the sea, and they were all, they're already dead. They were dead, and he's singing of a future victory yeah. that is yet to happen. And so in this case here, the Pharaoh of today the Pont Pontifus Maximus uh, coming out of Rome uh, that's worshiping the sun god Ra, just like Pharaoh did in his day, is the one rider coming out on his horse. Of course, Satan is the one riding this guy. Well, this it, it actually, we have five minutes more. we got to go to tie into the to Nimrod, because that truly is the that, sun yes, god. Do yes. we have a minute for that? Yes, we definitely we got do. All I day. think that we, we should. We got all day. Yes. <laughs> yes. But if you go back to the Babylonian, go. it starts back at the Tower of Babel. In Genesis uh, 11, right? Right. Because yeah. now we're, we're going to look at the clay. Some of the people, and one thing that well, John's going to go into. Oh, right. We forgot about that. We've got to tie in, <laughs> we've got to tie in Daniel's <coughs> vision of uh, this, this image that he sees. The head of gold, as we know, that, that goes back in time. Yeah. Uh, and, and brings it all the way down to the legs of iron, uh, iron and, the, and the feet of uh, part of iron and clay. So, yeah, let's yeah. Nimrod is the way we're going to bring that out. We're going to bring that out by going back to Nimrod. Yeah, so you go back to the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. Uh, Nimrod was the mighty hunter who, he's the one who said, let us make bricks and build a tower to the heavens yes. and make a name for ourselves. That's, that's a one world government with an antichrist figure. He's exactly let us right. let us make bricks. We're all the same. We're all the same. Sounds like Common Core today. Make everybody the same. Little robots. God doesn't make stone uh, bricks. God makes rocks and stones, and everyone's different. And that's humans. Everyone different. But here Nimrod's trying to make bricks and make everybody the same and build a tower, a one-world government. And now let me let me let me throw one thing in here for you guys to think about. Notice how he says, "Let us make." Like what we have in the beginning in Genesis. Yeah. Let us create man in our own image. And what does God do? He makes that man from clay. But the difference is, is God is able to breathe life into a clay figure. And it no longer is just dirt and potash. It becomes a living soul. And Nimrod is doing the same, same thing. Same thing. Let us make bricks out yeah. of the same clay. But his is not the same. That's right. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. So the Babylonian legend has it, Nimrod, uh, 
he marries this woman named Semiramis. Uh, when Nimrod died, I mean, by the way, this, this whole Tower of Babel, that's when God comes down and separates all their languages, and that's why we all speak different languages. And Because uh, you were not going to be able, God's not going to allow a one world government ruled by one person unless Jesus Christ is the one sitting on the throne doing it. That's right. And so when Nimrod dies, legend has it, he goes up to heaven and becomes the sun. His wife on earth is Semiramis. He impregnates her with the rays of, his son, of the sun. She gives birth to a boy named Tammuz. Tammuz lives for 40 years on earth, and then he is gored by a boar and killed. Semiramis, his mother, is very upset. She declares a 40-day uh, fast for mourning because, Semiram or because Tammuz lived 40 years. We're going to mourn one day for each year of his life, and then we will celebrate on that 40th day, and we'll eat uh, boar and... He was gored by the boar on the uh, spring solstice, which is first day of spring, May, uh, March uh, 21st-ish. Right. He was born on the winter solstice in uh, December. So you have all these little tie-ins that sound familiar. Semiramis, by the way, uh, she declares this feast for him. Later, when Semiramis dies, she goes up to heaven. She returns in a giant egg, which lands in the Euphrates River. It breaks open. She comes out as the goddess Ishtar, and she turns a rabbit into an egg-laying... No, she turns a bird into an egg-laying rabbit. Okay, that's all crazy talk, but that's... But now that's, you can see the where a lot of the so-called, um, the holidays that they have in I hate Christianity. To say, I hate to say the word Christianity because it's really not Christian. It's not Christianity. And, it, but, it, but unfortunately, and this is the sad part, so many people, they, we, we, you know, I want to say we in this case here, we were raised a certain way. I was, I was raised in a non-believing family. We knew we were Jews and that was it. But the thing is, in, in the Christian families, I understand you're raised this way. You're raised a Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, whatever the case may be. You learned all these traditions. And for most people, they just believe that that's part of Christianity. Yeah. I have no idea that all these pagan traditions from an ancient Babylonian custom were brought in to Christianity to try, because they wanted to try to make, a, a, again, a one world religion. And the thing is, John, this is what their intention is to do with a one world religion. Yeah. This is what the Pope declares as he makes his Chrislam, his one world religion right now, he declares publicly, this is Pope Francis now, there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church. Hmm. And he gives them one year to return. So if God says, come out of her, my people, except that you partake of her plagues, that, that's, we're living in the day where, and that's what's going to happen when the two witnesses come. The plagues are going to be poured out because the Bible says all manner of plagues they will be able to pour out. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be a part of it. Yeah. You know, if you go to those, the seven letters that Jesus writes to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, the first one is, uh, Ephesus, and it and that's representing each of these letters has a prophetic pointing to the next two thousand years. You may not fully understand this, but at least you've heard it for the first time here. But that first letter to Ephesus represents Christian Christianity during the uh, apostles' time. The second one was Smyrna. That was the the persecuted church, which went after the apostles are all dead. Rome is killing the Christians, throwing them to the lions. Then the third one was Pergamos. Pergamos is Pergamos, mixed marriage. This is when Constantine, he was of this pagan religion. And he was believing in all this Semiramis and Tammuz nonsense. But he became a Christian in 323. And he fires all his pagan priests and then hires them back as Christian priests. And they say, well, what do we do for Christianity? We have all these traditions from the old Babylonian. You know what? We've got this uh, Tammuz, who's the son. Why don't we make him Jesus? We'll take Semiramis, the mother, and we'll make her Mary. Instead of when she comes back as Ishtar, we'll call it Easter. 
you get the uh, egg laying rabbits thrown in and the fertility nonsense you it just all gets woven together even whenever you know I told you Tammuz was born it in December on the on the winter right. solstice on the shortest day of the year on the 25th of December so you got the days getting shorter and shorter and shorter. People were afraid. Oh my goodness, Nimrod is burning. He's, he's getting, he's upset with us. So they would go out and sacrifice a tree out into the woods, bring it in, put it in their house to kind of appease Nimrod in hopes that he would make the days longer. And they would decorate it with gold and silver. And, and they're doing all this stuff to, for Nimrod. Right. And... We've incorporated all that. Jeremiah 10 says, Do not be like the pagans who go out and cut a tree, bring it in your house, decorate it with gold and silver, nail it to the floor so it doesn't topple over. He means very specific. He says, Don't do what the pagans are doing. And what does every Christian do when we go out and cut trees down? Well, it's I'm almost as ridiculous. It's almost as ridiculous as Adam and Eve cutting a fig leaf. They're trying to do some sacrifice of a of a of a something green, right. God wants a sacrifice of something red. Exactly. <laughs> you know, a Christmas tree is not going to make the days longer. But you see how all that got woven in. And this is why the Catholic Church today is a very mother-son kind of influence. It's the Mary and Jesus. It's Semiramis and Tammuz. They just switched the names. Read Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel 8, remember Ezekiel gets taken back and shown the temple... And he's looking down and he sees all these people who are sitting at the gate of the temple, all these women, and they're mourning for Tammuz. That's Ezekiel 8. Right. So it was actually happening. The Jews were taken to Babylon and the ones who came back, they, they adopted a lot of that Babylonian religion and they brought it back. And they were, they were actually doing it. Ezekiel sees it. Yes. And, and that's the sad part because that's one of the things that even Ezra cries out against. Here... They go into captivity because of Babylonian customs, because or because, not, but because they were doing the pagan traditions that were common to the Babylonians. They were worshiping mm -hmm. idols and everything else, and they go into they go into exile because of that. And and of course we know that where they get brought in because Solomon literally brings in by marrying these women from these other lands and everything. It brings in idolatry into Israel, you know and. But it, it doesn't mean that Solomon was a bad man. He was trying to do right, but he, he went wayward. And that's what happens yeah. a lot of times. People come in, they start to do right, and end up going wayward. And also, too, in those seven uh, churches of Asia Minor, one of the things that I've also noticed, and I did a, a deep teaching on this as well, is that you can also see, besides that they can, they, they, they can type out the, the last 2,000 years of history, we also can see that in every age, those seven churches all seven are, roll. Yes. They There's all seven are on the planet today. Right. That's right. They were they were then, they were here now, and yet they metaphorically lay out the entire two thousand years yeah, ahead. It's unbelievable it, it's, it's these weird. seven letters. It, it is it is fascinating. What's it well maybe we'll go into a uh, a teaching on that next. So yeah. Next time me and John will see each other it's gonna be in Israel. He's coming over to Israel and uh That'd be a good time to do. Oh, I got days to kill, so I'm going to... Oh, do you? Yeah. Good. Well, praise the Lord. So do I. And I got a free place to stay. <laughs> That's right. He's going to stay with us. Now, this um, Daniel chapter 2, where he has the Nebuchadnezzar has the dream of the statue, head of gold. Yes. That's the Babylonian Empire, arms of silver, arms and chest. This is the Medes and the Persians. Right, the Medes and the Persians. They, took a, they conquered Babylon. The next is the midsection of, of bronze. Yes. This represents the Greek Empire. Then you have the two legs of iron. That's the Roman, the Roman Empire. Empire. And it had two legs. It had the eastern in Rome and the uh, eastern in Constantinople and the western in Rome. And a lot of people get that mixed up when they're looking at... Because what's happening today in the revived Roman Empire... They're thinking that the eastern part of the Roman Empire, and this is something Chuck Messler uh, said to me, and I really worked on him to try to get him to sway back the other way around, but this is where, because the Vatican has taken the Muslim people and creating their religion to begin with, and, and that influence has been pushed away from themselves to get people to believe that the Antichrist comes, or the Mahdi 
from the eastern leg of the Babylonian Empire, not realizing that Rome was the influence over the entire empire back then. What makes us think that Rome, the, that being the, uh, the western side, doesn't have the full uh, uh, impact on both empires again today. Yeah. In fact, that's what's causing all the wars. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know where he's coming out of. He's coming out of the, um, the Roman Empire. Yes. It could be, he could be Middle Eastern, he could be any, because he's all, it's all going to be the Roman Empire. Yes. But in, nevertheless, you'll notice each of these metals, gold, most valuable, silver, less valuable, bronze, even less, iron, and then he has the feet and toes of iron and clay, worthless. Iron doesn't mix with clay. You got strength, you got weakness. They don't work. But that's, and you'll notice that each one is less valuable, but right. each one gets stronger. Gold is malleable, soft. Silver is stronger. And each subsequent empire that overtook the next, it was stronger than the previous. Less valuable, but stronger. Yes, and bigger. And uh, that's the Roman Empire with the two legs. And they just became the feet and toes of iron mixed with clay. Right. That... <sighs> This is where we tie in Rome of today, the Roman Empire, with that original Babylonian. Uh, Babylonian the, yeah, let us make bricks. And they took clay and they made bricks. That, that's the original. Where is it? In Zechariah 5. Uh, Zechariah. Well, that's going to take a few minutes to find. It's one of them little Z ones at the end. Oh, yeah, yours is easier to find. I know it's, it is. Uh -huh. Look at that open right to it. I did too. Eventually. Okay. I did it immediately. <laughs> Zachary, high five. All right. You're so chosen, you oh, chosen person, you. Praise the Lord. Okay, five, five. Um, then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, what is it? And he said, this is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, moreover, uh, this is the, their resemblance, though all the earth, excuse me, go ahead. Uh, ephah, for those who don't know, it's a large basket that holds about five bushels. So right now we've got this angel talking to Zechariah. Zechariah says, what is this? It's a basket. Okay. And so uh, he says, and behold, verse 7, there was uh, lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth uh, in the midst of the ephah. A talent is a, heavy, a very heavy amount of weight. It's About 100 pounds. 100 pounds? Yeah. So there's a lead lid on this basket, and in this basket is some woman. And the angel is describing this to Zechariah. Okay. And she sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, this is uh, wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah. Cast it or her? Well, in this case here, it says it. Let me see what it is in the Hebrew language. What, yeah. do, you have, what do you have? In it the says he, it ca he cast her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. Okay. And then lifted uh, uh, I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there, there came out two women... And the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whether do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me to build it a house in the land of uh, Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. That's important right there. And that's very big. So you got... Here's the picture. You have the angel shows up, and it, Jesus describing, or he, he, angel's describing to Zechariah. Zechariah says, what is it? It's an ephah, a big basket, and there's a lead weight on it. And they took the lead weight off, and they look in, and he's this woman, and she, her name is Wickedness. And he throws this w woman and wickedness into the basket. Two other women show up who have wings like storks. If you go to Leviticus, storks are unclean animals. So these storks are not, these two women with wings of storks, they are not of God. And they pick up this basket and take it to the land of Shinar. Shinar is where Babylon was. Shinar is the right. Babylonian part. Okay, we're back. Sorry, we had a, someone at the door. But um, you have these two women, wings of storks, not of God. They pick up the basket. They take it to the plains of Shinar. 
what is this, who is this woman in this basket that Zechariah talks about? Her name, it says, is wickedness. Well, this brings us to Revelation 17. Exactly. Revelation 17, this is the woman on the beast. The woman on the beast, she's the Vatican. You have Revelation 17? What, what are the clues that it gives for, for this evil woman in 17 of Revelation? Okay. She sits on seven hills. Yep, sits on seven hills. And there came one of the seven angels which had, um, which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings... Now, the part about the many waters... Is That's very important. The, the waters always represent uh, peoples, nations, yes. tongues. It's what the Bible declares to us. So she sits on many waters. And in this case here, Rome is in every single nation on the earth. Yeah, the Vatican's everywhere. By the way, you see that, that the waters represent the nations... You see that way back in on the second day of creation, when God separated the waters. Yeah. It's it, a picture of the end of days. Because in the end of days, he's going to separate the nations. Some are going up, and some are going to stay down. It's, it's separating with a firmament. It's a tie in there, but... Exactly. But, with, well, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And that's interesting. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, but he separates the inhabitants of the earth from the kings. And the, the, the inhabitants, the ones that are drunken, are the inhabitants. That's the people that follow her. Not just the people that follow her, but that's what's happening to the different denominational peoples that are coming back into the Catholic Church. That's, mm -hmm. what's, that's what happened to Kenneth Copeland uh, and, and all their groups there. They were drunken. When, and when you're drunk, you have no ability to be able to, to function mentally correctly to think. In fact, the Bible says well, when a man becomes drunk uh, or, or tarries long at the wine, he sees a strange woman and she becomes pleasant and, and, or he also gets beat up and he doesn't know what happened to him the next day, but yet he'll do it again, mm -hmm. paraphrasing, of course. Yeah. So, so he, carried, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abomination of filthiness of her fornication. Everything you can see is you're looking at, you're looking at a mass uh, that happens at the Catholic Church. You're looking at all the, the gold, the precious things. Purple and scarlet, scarlet. seven yeah. hills. Exactly. I mean, it's just... It's, it's, it's just laying there. And then he says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Of course, Mystery Babylon because... It's but notice there's a comma Babylon. between Mystery and Babylon. It's Mystery Babylon the Great. Exactly. So he's alerting us to the fact, there's a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots. It's the greatest Babylonian empire that would have ever been. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It exceeds Nimrod's day altogether. Yeah, it, or, or it's the final representation of Nimrod's. It's the final. What do you call right. it? They the morphs into this it, final exactly, one. Exactly. Exactly. And then, uh, of course, she's and, a mother. Oh, by of the way, the Tower of Babel, where Nimrod built this tower, let us make bricks. It occurred on the plains of Shinar. This is important. We didn't mention that earlier, but that is important because Zechariah's prophecy has these two women taking this basket, this ephah, to the plains of Shinar. Exactly. This, this woman is evil. This woman is Rome. It's the, the whole Catholic system, and it's being taken to the Babylon, mm -hmm. to Shinar. It's a, it's a morph of these two religions or in the end of days. Exactly, bring it all together as one. And if yeah. she's the mother of harlots and abominations, and of course God talks about the uh, the abomin or Daniel speaks about the abomination that maketh desolate, and we see that the the um, the Muslim people, of course, they put the dome of the rock on the Temple Mount, and it is an abomination in the sight of God. But yet the Vatican is the one that creates that. She's the mother of the abomination, and we know that the Catholic Church is the ones that created the Muslim religion. Uh, of course, the Shiites don't realize that. The Sunnis, I think they, whether they know it or not, they still yeah. obey. And, and I've heard you say that. I don't, I don't know if it's true. We, we agree on many things, and I'm not saying we disagree on this. Right. You know what? 
show us, show us, God, the truth. But <laughs> but there are times where you'll say things that I don't 100 percent know. I don't know if it's true or not, and I might do the same. And you might have different uh, things. Be a Berean. Search it out. Find it for yourself. That's right. You have to. Yeah. You absolutely have to. Because you said that before that the Catholic Church started, and uh, I don't know that. Yeah. You you have to. What, where you get that from is from. Um, um, oh gosh, what is that guy's name? There's been several of the, uh, what they call the Jesuits that have come out of the Catholic Church. No, I do know the Jesuits are bad. They are the. Right. Yeah, they're, they're the they're CIA the undercover. Uh, do whatever you have to to get. Right. And, yeah. and the ones that have come out, uh, especially, and it slips the tip of my mind, I know his name so well, but uh, this one particular Jesuit that came out that was a Jesuit for 25 years. Yeah, I saw a video with... with right. Yeah. He, he reveals that from the secret yeah. teachings inside the, the Catholic Church that that's so. Yeah, I, need, the I need two or three to establish yeah. it. I need two or three witnesses to establish there it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> So, but the other thing is, though, as God says here, she's the mother of harlots and abominations. Uh huh. So, yeah. So oh, I know. She's the mother. She's the mother. I understand. I understand. So, anyway, and so it says, and I saw the. I don't woman, want to be accused of being a Catholic basher. No, okay, I got you. Am I too late now? After an hour. That's too late. He's a Catholic basher. You <laughs> I am what, not. You heard him say about Rome, right? And I don't. So I love the Catholics. Oh, yeah, but the, the Catholic, Catholic Church is horrible. There we go. That's. Settles it right. I'm that tells the truth. All right. His sugar will make him feel better. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Think about it like that. So, anyway, in closing, John, we know you're not a Catholic basher, only a Vatican basher. God bless. <laughs> so, uh, so, closing thoughts. Um, man, it's just things are happening so fast. This is, it's got all the answers right here. Yeah. I mean, it's like, why read the newspaper? This is the, new, this is the news right here. It's ahead of time. Amen. You get it. Amen. It's really incredible to watch. How much time do you think we got left? I know we don't set dates and times. Oh, gosh, I've got to go get. Yana, I don't mean today, I mean in oh. the west end and what, of the world. What time is it here, actually, though, seriously? Here. Ooh, yes, I do have to go get her. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you gotta check out your hotel. Yeah, in 10 minutes. So, anyway, God bless you. We're checking out. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom from Houston, Thank Texas. God, but... The um, armpit of America. <laughs> Look at Steve Bendenoon <laughs> is in my house. Can you imagine? Yeah. You know, you see these celebrities on TV and you think, Wow, look, it's so-and-so. He's in my house. So, God bless, Steve. I'm not even going to edit that out. That's just too... Uh, yes. Thank you all for coming. Can you all hear us up in the third balcony? There? Yeah. Yes, sir.